Hello, this is Dr. Debnath Chatterjee, and I'm joined here today by Dr. Monica Hoagland. We are both pediatric anesthesiologists at the Children's Hospital of Colorado and the University of Colorado School of Medicine. In addition, we are both members of the fetal anesthesia team at the Colorado Fetal Care Center. We are here today to summarize an educational review article titled Anesthesia for Fetal Surgery for the journal Pediatric Anesthesia. Welcome, Dr. Hoagland. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Before we get started, we would like to take this opportunity to thank the section editor, Dr. Mark Thomas, for inviting us to write this educational review article. Dr. Hoagland, would you like to start with a brief discussion on the different types of fetal interventions? Sure. There are three broad categories of fetal interventions, minimally invasive interventions, open mid-gestation fetal surgeries, and ex utero intrapartum treatment, or exit procedures. The majority of procedures are performed at mid-gestation with the goal of correcting a fetal anomaly early in gestation and allowing the fetus to have a period of normal development prior to delivery. Exit procedures are performed near-term gestation with the goal of maintaining uteroplacental circulation to enable controlled fetal surgical intervention prior to delivery of the newborn. Minimally invasive interventions are the most commonly performed fetal interventions. These include percutaneous and fetoscopic procedures performed under ultrasound guidance. Percutaneous or needle-based procedures include percutaneous umbilical blood sampling, radiofrequency ablation, balloon valvuloplasty, and shunt placement. Fetoscopic interventions include laser photocoagulation for twin-twin transfusion syndrome, umbilical cord coagulation, tracheal occlusion, amniotic band release, and ablation of posterior urethral valves. Percutaneous procedures require minimal maternal analgesia but require cooperation and immobility. Fetoscopic procedures involve the placement of one or more abdominal ports, which are likely to increase maternal anesthesia requirements. A variety of anesthetic techniques have been used for maternal comfort, including general anesthesia, neuraxial anesthesia, and local anesthetic infiltration with or without intravenous sedation. The choice of the anesthetic depends on the degree of surgical invasiveness, need for maternal and fetal analgesia and immobilization, maternal preference, and local practices. With continued refinement in surgical instruments and technique, more minimally invasive fetal procedures are being performed with local anesthetic infiltration or neuraxial techniques with sedation rather than general anesthesia. At our institution, the majority of minimally invasive fetal interventions are performed with a combined spinal and epidural neuraxial technique with intravenous sedation. Open mid-gestation fetal surgeries have evolved over the years. Currently, the most common indication is prenatal repair of a myelomeningocele defect. Less common indications include resection of large fetal lung masses, debulking of sacrococcygeal teratomas, and vesicostomy for lower urinary tract obstruction. These procedures require maternal laparotomy and hysterotomy and close hemodynamic monitoring of both the mother and fetus. They are performed under maternal general anesthesia with neuraxial anesthesia for postoperative pain control. Exit procedures are performed close to term gestation. During an exit procedure, a maternal laparotomy and hysterotomy are performed to expose the fetus. A fetal surgical intervention is then performed while the fetus is still on placental support from the mother. Immediately after completion of the procedure, the fetus is delivered. Indications for an exit procedure continue to evolve and now include securing the airway in fetuses with large neck masses, resection of large fetal neck, mediastinal, or lung masses, and ECMO cannulation. This technique allows the fetal surgical intervention to be performed while the fetus is still receiving hemodynamic and respiratory support from the mother. This turns a potential neonatal surgical emergency into a controlled procedure. Similar to open mid-gestation procedures, exit procedures are performed under maternal general anesthesia with neuraxial anesthesia for postoperative pain control. Thank you. Next, we will summarize the main anesthetic considerations during fetal surgery. I would first like to discuss the implications of maternal and fetal physiology on the anesthetic management of these patients. Pregnancy affects every organ system, and a comprehensive review of the physiological changes of pregnancy is beyond the scope of this review. However, it is important to know that the maternal cardiac output and oxygen consumption increases throughout pregnancy, reaching a peak in the immediate postpartum period. 
systemic vascular resistance, blood pressure, and hematocrit decline in early gestation, reaching a nadir in the second trimester. Blood pressure returns to pre-pregnancy values by term gestation. Iotocaval compression is an important consideration in parturients, and a wedge should always be placed beneath the patient to achieve uterine displacement when she is supine. Due to an increased mid-ventilation, parturients are chronically hypocarbic with a PCO2 near 30 millimeters of mercury and an increased bicarbonate to maintain normal acid-base balance. These patients are also at an increased risk for failed intubation and aspiration due to rapid hypoxemia, changes in upper airway anatomy, and increased gastric reflux. Fetal hemodynamics and oxygenation are important considerations during fetal surgery. The fetal heart rate is the most important determinant of cardiac output, and fetal bradycardia, which is a heart rate of less than 100, is a strong indicator of fetal distress. Common physiological stresses that result in fetal bradycardia include hypoxia, noxious stimulus, and hypothermia. The causes of fetal hypoxia include decreased oxygen delivery to the utero-placental circulation, decreased umbilical cord perfusion, and decreased delivery of oxygen to the fetal tissues. The gestational age at which a fetus is aware of pain is controversial. The cortical connections necessary for the perception of pain are thought to develop around 23 to 30 weeks gestational age, which is around the time or a little later than the mid-gestation procedures. However, noxious stimulus can cause significant hemodynamic effects in the fetus as early as 18 weeks of gestation. Therefore, although a fetus may not perceive painful stimulus, it is necessary to provide adequate fetal analgesia to prevent adverse hemodynamic responses to surgical stimuli. Fetal hypothermia is prevented by minimizing the amount of fetal exposure and delivering only the fetal body parts that are intended targets of fetal intervention. Fetal monitoring during most minimally invasive fetal interventions usually consists of intermittent measurement of fetal heart rate using Doppler ultrasound. This is generally performed immediately after induction and at the end of the procedure. During open mid-gestation and exit procedures, continuous fetal echocardiography is used to monitor fetal heart rate, ventricular function, atrioventricular valve competence, and ductal patency. In addition, during exit procedures, fetal pulse oximetry can be used to measure oxygen saturation and heart rate after partial delivery of the fetus. The normal range for fetal saturation is 30 to 70 percent, although these values vary by the site of sensor placement due to the multiple shunts present in the fetal circulation. Fetal blood may be sampled for analysis, but this is rarely done as it carries a risk for vasospasm or fatal hemorrhage. Maintenance of adequate utero-placental blood flow and management of uterine tone are key factors in the anesthetic management of patients undergoing fetal surgery. Acute decreases in utero-placental blood flow result in fetal hypoxia and bradycardia. This is prevented by ensuring adequate oxygen delivery to the utero-placental circulation, maintaining umbilical cord perfusion, and providing adequate oxygen delivery to fetal tissues. In the event of fetal distress, efforts should be made to improve maternal oxygenation, support her blood pressure with vasopressors or intravenous fluids, and relieve aortocaval compression. Uteric contractions can impair fetal perfusion, this is prevented by administration of tocolytics and amnio infusion, which will be detailed in our next discussion. The surgeons assess for kinking of the umbilical cord and reposition the fetus if needed. Fetal ventricular function and volume status are assessed by echocardiography. Fetal exposure to high doses of volatile anesthetic agents can result in fetal cardiac dysfunction. The technique of supplemental intravenous anesthesia with propofol and remifentanil decreases the dose requirements of volatile agents. This has been shown to decrease fetal cardiac dysfunction. During an exit procedure, a fetal intravenous line is obtained. This can be used for volume administration if the echocardiogram shows decreased ventricular filling. If these measures fail to correct fetal bradycardia, resuscitation drugs are administered, chest compressions are performed on the field, and emergent delivery of the fetus may be required. During maternal hysterotomy, it is crucial to provide profound uterine relaxation. 
Typically, this requires high doses of volatile agents with or without additional tocolytic agents, such as magnesium, beta agonist agents, and nitroglycerin. Due to the administration of high-dose volatile agents, vasopressor support is often required to maintain maternal hemodynamics. Loss of uterine volume is a strong stimulus for uterine contractions. Uterine volume is maintained intraoperatively by limiting fetal delivery and providing continuous amnio infusion of warm saline. For mid-gestation procedures, uterine relaxation is continued postoperatively to prevent preterm labor. For exit procedures, the return of uterine tone immediately after fetal delivery is crucial to prevent maternal hemorrhage. This is similar to the goals of a cesarean section and requires the administration of uterotonic agents such as oxytocin. Let's wrap up today. This podcast gives only a brief overview of the anesthetic considerations for fetal surgery. For a more in-depth review, including specific anesthetic management of different fetal procedures and the evidence in support of performing fetal surgery, I would like to encourage our listeners to read the full article in the journal Pediatric Anesthesia. Thank you, Dr. Hoagland. You're welcome.